Hi everyone! In this video, we'll be analysing Ted Hughes' poem, Bayonet Charge. Before we dive into the poem, let's spend a few moments on who Ted Hughes is. Hughes was born in 1930 in Mythamroyd, West Yorkshire, and he died in 1998 in Devon at the age of 68. Hughes worked for two years as a ground mechanic while serving in the Royal Air Force, then went to Cambridge and majored in anthropology and archaeology. He published his first manuscript, titled The Hawk in the Rain, in 1957, and it was received with widespread acclaim. Apart from his poetry, Hughes is perhaps best known for his marriage to fellow poet Sylvia Plath, but actually he had two turbulent marriages. Apart from his first one with Plath, he married a woman named Asia Weevil, who he had an affair with while still married to Plath. Both women would tragically go on to commit suicide, and it's fair to say that these marital strifes did a number on Hughes' reputation. To much controversy, he was also the editor and promoter of Plath's poetry after her death, and some have even speculated that he may have censored certain content about the marriage from her works. He himself apparently wrote poems about their marriage for 30 years, but didn't publish them until the year of his death, in the fastest-selling volume of English poetry ever seen, titled Birthday Letters. Personal issues aside, though, Hughes was a prolific and versatile author, and in his lifetime, published many poetry anthologies, translations, non-fiction, and children's books. In 1984, Hughes was appointed Poet Laureate of the United Kingdom. Hughes himself had never actually served on the front lines. He was born after World War I in 1930, and for national service, he worked as a ground wireless mechanic in the Royal Air Force, during which time he apparently read and reread Shakespeare and watched the grass grow. But his poem, Bayonet Charge, published in 1957, captures a soldier mid-action and mid-thought while running for his life in battle, and is no less poignant and vivid an account for the absence of Hugh's own personal experience. The poet was apparently inspired by his father's stories about the Western Front, where Hughes Sr. had fought and escaped death, eventually returning home as one of the few men who had survived the Battle of Gallipoli in 1915-16. I will now read the poem once, and if you wish to do so yourself, feel free to pause or fast forward the video. Suddenly he awoke and was running, Raw and raw seemed hot khaki, his sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire, hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air. He lugged a rifle, numb as a smashed arm, the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eyes, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. In bewilderment, then, he almost stopped. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? He was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running. And his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. Then the shot slashed furrows, threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in the threshing circle. Its mouth wide open silent its eyes standing out. He plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge. King, honour, human dignity, etc. dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air his terror's touchy dynamite. So, at the start of this poem, the soldier wakes up in a violent spurt. The dactyl of suddenly plunges the reader right into the heart of the action, as the poem's narrative opens in medias res. The dactylic rhythm of da-da-da 
also sounds like a machine gun going off, which echoes the reference to the rifle in line four and line six, and suits the context of the battlefield. The first answer is all speed, noise, sound and fury rolled into one, as we see the soldier running and stumbling his way across the field. There's a jolting, irregular rhythm to the stanza, which is created by the mishmash of dactyls and iams, as we see in the lines, bullets smacking the belly out of the air, and the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. So this dynamic impression is mirrored in the language as well, which is chock full of kinesthetic imagery reinforced by the gerunds of running, stumbling, hearing, smacking and sweating. But as we reach the second stanza, there's a temptation for all the running, stumbling, smacking and sweating to stop altogether. As we see the soldier asking himself that million dollar question, why? Why is he running, he thinks. What is he running from? And what is he running towards? In line nine, the bifurcation of outward action and inward thought comes to the fore. We see that the soldier doesn't actually stop running. It says he almost stopped. But his mind suspends for a moment to consider, in bewilderment, the forces that compel and propel him to keep running. Now here, the poet combines the metaphor of clockwork with the metonymy of the stars and the nations. In this question, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second, it zooms out from the scrutinising glare that has so far been posed on the soldier in the first stanza and lead us to question just how the soldier came to be in that very moment and in that very situation that he now finds himself in. The metaphor of the clock face and the soldier as the clock hand conveys a sense that the man is running out of time and so must run even faster without stopping. But this image of the clock also functions as a memento mori, with the reminder of time that no matter how quickly or desperately he runs, there is always an expiration date, and that he is only ever running towards death. And so immediately it seems absurd that he should be running in escape for his life, when ultimately it all ends up in the same place anyway. Meanwhile, the stars and the nations are metonymic substitutes for fate and politicians, which are both forces that, to varying extents, appear to ultimately dictate how everyone's lives turn out. And so, together, these forces prod the soldier onwards in his blind frenzy of compulsive movement, which the enjambment from line 11 to the first half of line 14 cinematically reflects. The phrase still running jolts us out of this kinesthetic stream as it hits against the caesura of the comma and proceeds into the static suspension of and his foot hung like statuary in mid stride. Now there's two ways of understanding the phrase still running, depending on whether we read the word still as an adverb or an adjective. As an adverb, still means to continue in the same way which reflects the literal action of the soldier in this scene. But as an adjective, things become a little bit more interesting, because still, as an adjective, means not moving or deep silence, in which case we're looking at the exact opposite meaning as still in the form of an adverb. And immediately, if we think about still as an adjective, the phrase becomes an oxymoron, and as such, crystallises the asynchronous tension between outer movement and inner thought, as we see the soldier's limbs still moving, but his mind has in fact already come to a standstill. Let's now move on to the form. If we look at the shape of the stances, we'll notice that there is one protruding line that juts out in the first and final stances 
which are lines 3 and 19. Both lines seem to offer a visual mimicry of the bayonet at the tip of a rifle, but they could also be a syntactical reenactment of the soldier's forward lunging momentum. Note that they both end with the symbolism of the green hedge, which seems to rub against what's happening in the poem. Hedgerows are normally found in well-maintained orderly gardens, while greenery connotes life. But the soldier is clearly captured in a state of disorder, and the danger that surrounds him seems to position him closer to the axis of death. So is he running towards a vision of hope, despite its seeming unreachability, which is implied by the fact that he begins running towards the hedge and continues running towards the same hedge even as the poem reaches its end? Now this question of just what the soldier is running for is examined in the middle stanza, which also happens to be one line shorter than the first and final stanzas. This stanzaic lapse seems to suggest that something is amiss that there is a missing piece to it all, whether it be the reason for his constant running, or the rationale for being a part of this madness of war, or even that missing eighth line from the middle septet, mirrored also by the incompleteness of the mid-stride. One of the interesting observations we can also make about the poem is its many references to circularity. Note, for example, the circular motif in the objects and actions of this list. For example, we have the cyclical shape that one's legs make while running, the reference to bullets smacking the belly out of the air, the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest, that metaphor of the clock face in cold clockwork, the yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, and also its mouth wide open silent, its eyes standing out. These are all images of circularity, but what of it? Well, perhaps Hughes here is suggesting that there is no end to the business of warfare, and that even if one manages to outrun a bullet, there are greater forces, recall those stars and nations, that keep the cycle of war going, and that even if one battle concludes, another one will emerge in due course. The anatomical circles of running legs, the rabbit's open wide mouth, and the teary or bulging eyes of the soldier or the rabbit are juxtaposed against the circles of temporality, as in the cold clockwork, and those of hellishness, as in rolled like a flame. This juxtaposition puts forth the simple but pessimistic idea that man can neither outrun time nor overtake his own potential for evil, and that war is ultimately a cyclical phenomenon which can never end. Finally, let's examine one of the more striking similes in this poem, which comes at the end of stanza three. King, honour, human dignity, etc. dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm. Here, the cavalier tone of etc. may imply that, in times of war, the values that one is taught to hold dear, patriotism, decency and human dignity, immediately lose their importance, and if pursued, could even jeopardise one's chances of survival. As such, there is a need to jettison them as one would bombs, which is why they are here dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm by the soldier. So by comparing these values to luxuries, Hughes mocks the naivete of those who claim that war is fought for noble causes, because one is almost always forced to dispense with nobility in the heat of battle, and to prize survival above all else. And that's it everyone. If you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel for other GCSE and A-level English literature videos. 
Make sure you also check out the blog post for this in the description box below. And don't forget to leave me a comment so that you let me know what you're studying and what else you want to see from this channel in the future. See you soon.